Well, it's good to see you this morning. Hope you've had a good week. I'm glad we can be in the Lord's house together to serve and worship this morning. Let's stand. Page 278 at Calvary is really our theme for worship. It was what Christ has done for us, and it was sufficient. It was enough to cover our sin, our guilt, our shame at Calvary. Let's sing together. Page 278 at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not it was for me he died, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty. Let's sing that second by God's word as we sing that second. Kids, you can be dismissed back to the gym for junior church as we sing that second verse. By God's word, at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. We'll sing that last verse in a moment. The choir's going to come down, shake hands, greet those around you, and spend some time together before we sing that last verse. Amen. Let's sing that last verse together. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. continue singing page 316 my jesus fair let's sing together as we continue to look at what christ has done for us page 316 in your hymnals if you need it my jesus fair was pierced by thorns by thorns grown from the fall thus he who came the curse was torn to that curse for all. O oh, love divine, O oh, matchless grace, that God should die for men. With joyful grief I live my praise, adoring all my sin, adoring only Him. My Jesus pure was crushed by God, by God in judgment just, the Father grieved, yet turned his rod on Christ, made sin for us. O oh, love divine, O oh, matchless grace, that God should die for man, when joyful grief I live my praise of more. 
my sin. Adore. Let's sing on that last together. My Jesus strong shall come to reign, to reign in majesty. The Lamb arose and death is slain. Lord, come in victory. O love divine, O matchless grace, that God should die for men with joyful grief. I live my praise, abhorring all my sin, adoring only Him. Amen. Well, it is good to see you this morning, and we're glad you're here with us. Men, if you would come, we'll take this morning's tithes and offerings. I do want to mention, if you're visiting here with us this morning, we are so thankful that you took time to join us this Sunday. And if you would, on your way out, we have just a little bag that we'd like to give you, just a, a thank you gift. And if we can help you with anything, please just let us know. Well, uh, Brother Bill, would you mind at least for prayer for our offering this morning? Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, let's stand together for our final song this morning, page 365, if you need it. But we're going to sing together, There is a Redeemer. Isaiah 49 says, I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. That is the God we serve. That is the God we're going to take time to remember later this morning and what all he has done for us. Let's sing together, There is a Redeemer. There is your 
sing together on that last. When we get to that chorus, a lot of the instruments drop out. We'll sing with our voices. You know a part, sing a part as we sing that chorus together at the end. Let's sing on that last. When I stand in glory, I will see his face, and there I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank singing this morning. You may be seated. a lamp for me over and over, a light to my path when I don't know the way. He is my rising sun, the fountain I drink from. His love spills over and over, an almighty, infinite Father is He. He is my rising sun. The fountain I drink from. He is beyond worthy of praise. His mercies are new every day. Your grace rolls upon me, my life. I lay at your feet. In all things, His way is supreme. With passion, I give everything. Secure and my joy, it lives in you. With every breath I can breathe, I love you too. He is beyond worthy of praise, his mercies are new every day. Your grace rolls upon me. Your feet in all things, His way is supreme with passion. I give everything, my life is secure, and my joy it lives in you. With every breath I can breathe, with every song I can sing.
Amen. That was wonderful this morning. I don't know about you, but I needed that, and I appreciate the good worship this morning already. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 this morning? Matthew chapter 5, as we are working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, just a quick note, I don't know that it affects you much, but just so you know, my family will be gone this week. You've been kind enough to let us have a uh, vacation. We're going out to Yellowstone with our family and camping. And you say, are you campers? No, we, we, we are not campers. We've decided it's either going to be the greatest vacation of all time or the worst. So we'll let you know when we get back. Uh, we're, we're staying at a large campground, so my hope is the bears are full by the time they, they get to us. So we'll find out. Well, uh, this morning, before we get started, I do want to mention, you probably noticed up front, we are set up for uh, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper this morning. And uh, what that is, there is nothing mystical about that. In a few moments, we'll have a time where we will eat uh, a cracker together. We will take some juice and partake together. And uh, really, what Christ is doing when he has the church participate in that is it's just a moment for the church to reflect back and make sure we are centered on him. Uh, when you're eating the bread, you're remembering his body that was broken for us. When we drink the cup, we're remembering his blood that was shed for us. And and God knew we have a tendency to get bitty, busy and we can, uh, uh, we can get off center and forget to make the main things the main things. And so what communion is, is it's a moment as a church where we can come together and intentionally focus on what Christ has done for us. And if you are here and you are saved, baptized, and right with the Lord, we would encourage you and invite you to participate with us uh, as we partake in just a moment. Well, if you look in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38... We're going to wrap up chapter 5, Lord willing, this morning. It says this in verse 38. Christ is speaking in the greatest sermon ever preached, and he said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. In other words, don't retaliate and, and get vengeance against someone that is evil towards you. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee uh, at the law and take away thy coat, let him also have thy cloak. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. We'll stop there, and let's ask the Lord to bless our time together this morning. Lord, we come to you today, and Lord, I pray that uh, today would be a day where uh, we examine our hearts, and we make sure that we are right with you, that we are not harboring any sin or any bitterness or any uh, anything that would... Uh, defile us and that we would come to you with pure hearts and worship you. And what I pray is we take a moment here to uh, reflect on what you've done on the cross, the sacrifice that you've paid, that uh, it would rekindle and restir that love that we have for you and, and recenter and refocus us in our service to, towards you. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity as a church family to come together and have this special time. I pray that as we head into your word here that you would just give uh, clarity and that you would give power to your preaching and that you would use in the lives of your people. We thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, in Matthew chapter 5, the section we are in, if you remember, uh, Christ, he is in a section that he started out by telling the listeners, hey, you may want to brace yourself for what you're about to hear. He said, what I'm about to tell you, it's going to seem pretty radical, but, but what we looked at last week was this. We were not created to live a normal life, were we? Uh, we were created to live a radical life. And so far in this section, Christ has already told his listeners that, that he has called us to radical reconciliation. Do you remember he said, if you are giving a sacrifice to the Lord, and while you are giving the sacrifice, you remember someone has ought against you, he said, leave the sacrifice and go do the best you can to make things right between you and that person, because you cannot be right with God until you're right with others. He said, I'm calling you to radical reconciliation. And then he called us to radical righteousness. You remember he said, it's, it's better for you to cut off your hand than, than to let your hand offend you, or in other words, cause you to sin. In other words, he says, do everything in your power to live a righteous life. Uh, make it hard to sin and easy to do right. He then went on and he talked about radical relationships. He says, choose to, to take your marriage seriously in a world that takes marriage lightly. And then he said, choose to have radical reliability. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Live every moment of your life and every word that you say as if you are under oath. And, and he wraps up this segment with two more radical calls that he gives us in our lives. I want you to see these. First of all, he calls us in verse 38 through 42 to live a life of radical responses. A life of radical responses. Look at verse 38. 
He says, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We've all heard that before, haven't we? Uh, this is actually a direct quote from the Old Testament. It's known as the lex talionis. It's the idea of let the punishment fit the crime. And when Christ gave this instruction, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the, the idea was twofold. He, he first of all wanted to deter people from committing crimes against one another. But on the other side, he was also giving this instruction because he wanted to protect the offender from excessive retribution. You see, God, he, he knows the hearts of mankind. And he knows that when we are wrong, we do not just want to get even, we want to get ahead, don't we? I like what one, one commentator said. He said that, that what he is doing here is he, he is telling us that uh, even though we want retaliation, our heart should not be that we want retaliation plus interest. He said our sinful, selfish sense of justice wants a pound of flesh for an ounce of offense. And what Christ is saying and what God made this commandment for was this. It was in one part to protect offenders from having excessive retribution given back to them for their crime. And yet the Pharisees and the Jews of this time, they, they had totally missed that part of the law. All they saw was this was an excuse for them to get justice, to get an eye for an eye. And they were going to milk it for everything it was worth and get as much as they could out of any offense that was done to them. And they, they completely missed God's heart behind it. And God, he, here Christ, he, he gives four illustrations of what the heart of this command was. He gives four illustrations. In verse 39, he, he shows us a radical response to insults. Look at verse 39. He says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Boy, there's some pretty famous sayings in this passage. Turn the other cheek. Uh, some people have looked at this passage and they've used it as an argument to be pacifist. Uh, the idea that you are not allowed to defend yourself if you are being attacked. There, there is no such thing as uh, uh, protecting yourself. Is that what Christ is saying in this passage? No. Uh, notice what he says. He makes special note to say that if someone smite thee on, their, on your right cheek, now think about that. If, if the person that you are going against hits you on your right cheek, what does that mean they hit you with? It means they hit you with their left hand. It doesn't mean that this is a knockout blow. It's the idea of a backhanded slap. And what he is talking about here is he is talking about a radical response to insults. Uh, a couple of months ago, at the beginning of the summer, uh, Pastor Joey and the teens, they did a, a teen rally, a week-long rally, and it was called Pizza Wars this year. And uh, Pastor Joey came in the office one of the days, and uh, he, said, he, said, uh, he said, Brian, would you mind helping me with the video that we're going to put up for our social media accounts and all that? How many of you saw the video? Do you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, he came in, and he said, he said, can you help me with this video? I said, I said well, well, what do I got to do? And he said, well, it's simple. He said, all you got to do is you got to take a piece of pizza, and you got to slap me in the face with it. And I, I said, I said, Joe, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I can't be doing that. But since it's for ministry, I'll make an exception. <laughs> so he set up the camera, and you saw the final video. What, I, I, I just must not be cut out for being in front of a camera, because it, it took probably four or five takes before I got it right. I don't know what I kept messing up. And a slap to the face, that's what Christ is talking about here. He's not talking about self-defense. He's, he, he's talking about an insult. It would be comparable to our day to someone spitting in your face. He's saying, when you've been insulted, how do you respond? He says, the, the instinct is to retaliate. But what you should do instead is you should turn the other cheek. I'm not going to respond to your insult with another insult. I'm not going to respond to your disrespect with more disrespect. I heard about a soldier that... Uh, was a good Christian young man. He was strong about his faith, and he went off into a uh, boot camp, and there was another fellow soldier there that was uh, agnostic and very hostile towards God and the things of God, and, and every opportunity he could, he would, he would mock and belittle and tear down this Christian young man. And one night, they came back to the barracks, and this agnostic came in, and he was in a, a drunken stupor, and as he went to his bed, he picked up one of his boots, and he he threw it at this young Christian, hit him in the back of the neck, and then, then he passed out in his bed in his stupor. Well, the Christian soldier, he, he got up. He went over to the man that had thrown the boot and, and found the other boots. 
He brought it back to his own bed. Now he had both boots, and he pulled them out, and he, he shined both of them to a spit shine, then walked back over and put them under the man's bed in their place. And, and it wasn't long before every man in that company knew how those shoes had been shined. That's what Christ is saying here. He's saying, when you are insulted, the proper response is saying, I am not going to retaliate. I am not going to uh, return evil for evil, but I'm going to absorb the blow. He shows us, second of all, an illustration. We see an, a radical response to injustice in verse 40. He says, if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. You see, in the first century, someone could sue you for uh, literally the shirt off of your back. It's where we get the phrase that, uh, I lost my shirt in that deal, if you've ever heard that phrase before. And what they could do is they could sue you for your coat, or basically your shirt, but, but they could not sue you for your outer garment, your cloak. Because back then, in this day, it was a, an indispensable item. It was needed for modesty and for protection from the elements and even bedding at night. And so, so the law said you could sue someone for their shirt, but you could not sue them for their cloak. And, and what Christ says is this, when someone sues you and takes your shirt, he says, go ahead and go the extra mile and give them your cloak also. Now again, understand what he is saying. He is not saying that when we have dispute, disputes with others that we, we throw all reason to the wind and we are doormats. What he is saying is this, he is saying when, you are, when there is a dispute, someone has to be the shock absorber. And the idea is that, that I don't have to be the one that gets the last word. I am willing to take the loss so that we can move forward. I will absorb the blow without retaliation. He gives us a third illustration in verse 41. He says, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. You probably heard the phrase, go the second mile. This is where it comes from. Uh, back then, a Roman soldier, they had the right to compel any non-Roman citizen to carry their equipment for up to a mile. And so what would happen is a, a Jewish man would be out in the streets and in the market, and he would have his whole day planned out of what he needed to do and the work needed to get done. And, and a soldier would come up and tap him on the shoulder, give him a 90-pound backpack, and compel him to march for one mile. Uh, the Jews had had it down to where they would count the exact paces of a mile. And, and when they took that last step, they, they would drop that pack like a bad habit and their job was done. And what Christ says is this. He says, once you take that last step, he said, instead of dropping the pack, why don't you turn to that soldier and say, if you don't mind, could I carry your pack another mile for you? That's another level of humility. That's another level of, of service. David Tice, he was here with us a couple weeks ago, and he was uh, telling us a story about his church. He said that uh, they're in Las Vegas where they planted their church, and one day a police officer came off the street into the church building in the middle of the week and, and wanted to talk to one of the pastors. Pastor Tice wasn't there, but his assistant pastor, Matt, was there. And the pastor came in and started to meet with Matt and said, uh, I don't know if you know this, but you are two blocks away from uh, the worst crime neighborhood in all of Las Vegas. He said, every week we're in there and we're taking bodies out and there's all these arrests. And he, he said, we've come to the conclusion we cannot arrest our way out of this problem. We, we need something to help these people that's going to change their lives. And, and we were wondering if you and your church could help us. And Pastor Matt, he heard that and he thought, uh, what kind of request is that? What, what can we do to make a difference in that? And, and as he was thinking that, the Lord brought this verse to his mind. And in that moment, they developed what they would end up calling the second mile ministry. But the church, they began to, uh, in the next couple of weeks, they loaded up a bunch of people, inflatables, and they went down to the community, and they, they set up a community day, and they preached the gospel, and, and they started to use their resources, and their influence, and their energy to, to share Christ with his neighborhood. And he said within a year, violent crimes in that neighborhood had gone down 27%, and now it's one of the uh, nicer neighborhoods in the whole area. And all of that started because he remembered the instructions here. Uh, seemingly seemingly excessive requests. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you, do you ever feel like you have been asked more than what is fair? Uh, do you ever have a, a boss who gives you more work than what was initially on your job description? Uh, do you ever have a boss who expects you or asks you to do work after hours without getting paid for it? What is Christ saying here? 
He's saying in those moments, he says, what you do is you, you do not just do the bare minimum to get by, but you do your very best and you give all that you have. And the, the idea is you recognize that you are not ultimately serving and working for that boss, but you are serving and you're working for the Lord. A radical response to inconvenience. And then finally, he gives a fourth illustration. He has a radical response to inadequacy in verse 42. He says, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Teens, this would be a great verse to memorize. And the next time you want something from your parents, quote it to them and see what happens, all right? <laughs> to him that asks, turn not away, let him borrow it. You see, back in this day, every seven years, there was a thing called a, uh, uh, the sabbatical. It was the idea that every seven years, all the debts would be wiped out and everything would be reset. And, and so what would happen is, as you would get close to that seven-year mark, the lenders, they would be very reluctant to lend money to those that needed it because there was a, a lower probability that they would ever get their money back. The problem was people were needing this money in order to, to meet the bare necessities of life, to have food and shelter and all that sort of thing. And so, so what Christ is saying is this. He's saying even if it would turn your loan into merely a gift, Make sure that you are taking care of people. Again, he is not telling us to, to be poor stewards of our money and our resources. He's not saying that we indiscriminately give our money to anyone that asks. What he is saying is this. He is saying that, that in a world that has become callous towards the needs of others, he's saying keep a compassionate heart. He is saying you need to have a radical response to other people. Be the person that, that breaks the cycle of retaliation. Uh, sometimes we can be so focused on our rights, we can be so focused on winning a fight that we end up losing relationships because of it. And what he is saying is, he says, we need to be willing to lay down our rights and to respond to others with humility. We see that we are to have a radical response, then finally, we are to live a life of radical reflection. A life of radical reflection. Look at verse 43. He says, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. What he's about to talk about in this section is that, that we are to radically reflect the love of God to those that are around us. And he makes a quote here of the Pharisees. See, the, the Pharisees had made this law that, that you are to love your neighbor, but you can hate your enemy. Now, the problem with that is that is not in Scripture. In the Old Testament, it says that you are to love your neighbor, but they made the rest up by themselves. You see, in their mind, anyone that was like you, who was a fellow Jew, that was your neighbor. And if anyone was not your neighbor, then by default, they must be your enemy. And if they are your enemy, then you can hate them. And Christ is saying, you, you, have, you have totally missed the point of the, the entire command. Uh, the Jews, they, they were showing good to those that were like them. They were showing love to those that loved them back. Uh, one quote from a Pharisee of that age said this, they said, if a Jew sees a Gentile fall into the sea, let him by no means lift him out. For it is written, you shall not rise up against the blood of your neighbor, but this man is not your neighbor. Boy, uh, that is a long way from what God intended with this commandment, is it not? God had said, you are to love your neighbor. And out of that, they found an excuse on how they can let Gentiles drown without stepping into hell. Look at verse 44. He says, but instead of that mindset, instead of that teaching you've heard from the Pharisees, he says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What do you do to those who have been evil against you? He says you're to love them. He says you're to bless them, you're to do good to them, you're, you're to pray for them. I was reading a little devotional book a couple of weeks ago, and, and in it was a, a story of a guy by the name of Richard Wormbrand. If you've ever heard of a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs, he is the one that founded that ministry. Uh, in the early 1970s, he, he was in a uh, communist Romania when, when he was a preacher for the Lord, and they took him and they put him in prison for his preaching, and, and they call him the Iron Curtain Paul because of all he went through and the way that he spread the church through all that. And for 14 years, this man was uh, in prison, and for three of those years, he was in solitary confinement. The only people he would see for that three-year stretch would be the soldiers that would come and take him off, and they would daily torture him, and then they would put him back into solitary confinement. 
One of the soldiers that was assigned to him was uh, one day walking past his cell, and he heard Richard Wormbrand praying, and, and he opened the door, and here's what he said to Richard. He says, how come you continue to pray? He says, we've taken away your freedom, we've taken away your family, we've taken away your possessions, we have taken away everything, and yet you continue to pray. And then he asked the question, what are you praying for now? He says, and as Richard Wormbrand looked at the man's eyes, he responded, he said, well, right now, I'm praying for you. I tell you, that is what this verse is. What do you do to those who are your enemies? You do good to them. You love them. You pray for them. I, I tell you, you will have a hard time hating someone that you choose to pray for on a daily basis. And maybe, maybe to start, you, you can't say everything that needs to be said, but you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm struggling with this person. I'm struggling, struggling with loving them, but, but Lord, to the best of my ability, will you help me to love them? And Lord, will you do good in their life? Will you bless their family? Will you help their career? Will, will you show them your need for you? He says, what do you do for the enemies? You love them, and you bless them, and you pray for them. When we do this, what happens? Well, verse 45 says, that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. He says, when you do this, you're going to resemble your heavenly father. He says, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. He says, when you choose to love and bless and pray for and do good to those who have not done good to you, he says, you are radically reflecting the love of God to those around you. St. Augustine said this, he said, good for good and evil for evil, that is natural. Evil for good, that is devilish. But good for evil, that is divine. You see, God, he does good to his enemies. And every one of us should be thankful for that because every one of us was born an enemy of God. If God did not do good to his enemies, we would have no hope. And yet God, he, he chose to love and to do good to us when we were his enemies. And he says, when you choose to do that, you are reflecting the nature of God. It is not natural for us to love those who have harmed us. It is supernatural. It is the nature of God to forgive and to love enemies. I'll end with this story. I came across a, a, a very intriguing story of a lady uh, who a man broke into her home and, and just a horrific crime. He uh, beat her up, sexually abused her, and then shot her and actually left her for dead and miraculously she survived. And the lady, she was a Christian young lady, and as she recovered and they finally caught this man and they, they convicted him and brought him in for sentencing, this lady came to the courtroom to, to stand before the judge to say what she thought should be done to this man. And the judge, he had, he had seen many of these cases before, and he expected that, that an angry, vengeful lady would come in and, and demand that the fullest extent of the law be carried out in this man, but, but instead she walked into the courtroom and she said this, she said, yes, society does need to be protected from this man. But you need to know, Your Honor, that I am not after vengeance. And I am not after retribution because I know those things won't change what has happened to me and they will poison my heart. She went on to say, I, I want to help this man. She says, I have discovered through the investigation that, that he has a mild mental handicap and he obviously needs help and, and I want to make sure that he gets the help he needs for his own sake. He says, I do not want him to suffer. I have suffered enough for the both of us. I want what's in his best interest, and with God's help, I want to forgive him. Well, the judge heard her remarks, and, and on the stand, he began to cry. It took him a few moments to compose himself, and then on the record, here's what he said. He said, the reason I am crying is because of her forgiving nature. He said, it is so unusual for the victim of such a vicious crime to have such a forgiving attitude. And listen to this phrase. He says, and I think that reflects all the best that there is in human nature. Now, I would disagree with that last statement. Because I don't think there's anything in human nature that has that type of love and that type of forgiveness. The, the only nature that shows that type of love and forgiveness is the divine nature of our Heavenly Father. And when we choose to show forgiveness to others, we are radically reflecting God's character to others. Wouldn't it be long after Christ gave this message that Roman soldiers would literally come to him and compel him to make the march to a uh, trial that was nothing but a mock trial. 
uh, they would take him and they would spit in his face and they would buffet his cheek and, and they would insult him and, and they would take him and they would take not just his coat but also his cloak and they, they would cast lots for his garments and, and all the things that he talks about here would be done to him and yet what did Christ do through all of it? He never spoke a word. He never demanded his rights. And after they did all that, they took Christ and they, they, they put nails through his hands and they, they put nails through his feet and they hung him on a cross. And as they lifted him up, Christ said seven phrases that we know of on the cross. Do you remember what one of those was? One of the phrases Christ said in that moment was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We come this morning and we are reminded of the humility of Christ that did not demand his own rights, but he laid them down. As we look at the, the communion and we remember his blood that was shed and his body that was torn, it, it is a call for us also to be ones that reflect that nature to those around us. Would you bow with me? Lord, we come to you this morning and we step back and we remember the suffering that you went through. We remember the price that you paid. We remember what you have done for us so that while we were your enemies... You gave up your life so that we could live. Lord, I pray that today as we reflect on that, that, Lord, we would give you our all, that we would not hold any sin in our hearts, that we would make sure that we are right with you, that we would make sure that we are uh, radically responding and radically reflecting your love to those around us. We thank you for this time. I pray that you would just help us as a church to uh, glorify you through it. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning, in verse 23 the Bible says this, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged.
Brother J.R., if you would lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very word. We thank you for your many blessings. Father, we thank you for what you did on the cross. Lord, you shared your blood so that we could have salvation for believers. Father, I thank you for this time that we can stop and evaluate and Lord, just remember what you've done for us. Father, help us to just never forget what you've done for us. We pray that you bring us Christ in Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Shall we partake together?
Chuck, if you would lead us in prayer. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Shall we partake together? And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Would you stand with me, please? We'll end with a hymn of uh, victory and then close in prayer. Amen. Let's be together. Thank you.